Uh, okay, thanks everyone. Uh, great to be here. I, I enjoy speaking at clinics. I like kind of, uh, you know, sharing some of the info that we have with people and, and uh, these have been excellent sessions overall. Uh, you know, thanks Dave and Scotty, everybody else involved, including all the guys who presented prior to this. Um, you know, all these past clinic sessions can be found on YouTube. So all you have to do is go to YouTube, <clears throat> search three phases coaching. Uh, three phases is all one word. It'll come up with their own page. You, you can subscribe to the page so you get notifications when new things are, uh, are coming up. So obviously we're going through a bit of a strange time right now with the pandemic. Uh, so I kind of look at it like we may as well, you know, as a coaching fraternity, try and uh, make ourselves better coming out of this thing. Uh, the other thing I'm appreciative for is this clinic gave me a reason to shower today. So that was nice. So <clears throat> coaching, I think, is one of the most rewarding jobs in the world. Uh, it can be one of the most demanding as well. So there's a great responsibility to you when you decide to help out. So I appreciate everybody who's doing this. You know, I appreciate everybody who's in the clinic right now trying to get better, uh, you know, trying to learn a little bit, um, you know, just spending some time doing something constructive and productive instead of kind of, you know, sitting around wallowing in the mire, uh, buying into a bunch of the hype or the BS surrounding all this. Uh, you know, we just got to get through this and we'll get back to doing the things that we really love. So I think a few of the things that are important right now is take advantage of this time to build some relationships. Whether you're building a relationship with uh, fellow coaches, uh, players on your team, coaches in different parts of the world, just take some time, try and foster that a little bit. So uh, don't kid yourself that your players will be looking to you for guidance and leadership right now, uh, especially at the younger ages, you know, the high school guys and things. Uh, a lot of uncertainty around those young men, you know, and, and just kind of reach out to them, you know, make sure your players know you care. Uh, take some time, talk to them, uh, utilize some of this technology like we're doing. Use Zoom, use FaceTime, Microsoft Teams. Uh, you know, you can share your playbooks, share some workouts, you know, make sure the guys are still doing things. You can share drills that they could do in their backyard, uh, maybe a park across the street if, if there's nobody there. Uh, maybe they can do it in their basement, they can do it in their living room, they can stretch, they can do a whole bunch of things like that. So. Uh, I'll just take a couple minutes introducing who I am. Most people in the room probably know me uh, or have worked with me a little bit in the past. And again, I appreciate all y'all that are out doing that. <clears throat> I'm currently the running back coach with the University of Regina Rams. And I'm also the offense coordinator with U18 Team Sask. Uh, I've been the offense coordinator for the last six years uh, with, with Team Saskatchewan and the under 18 team. Um, there's going to be a few changes on that coaching staff right now. Uh, I can't give anything away right now, but I'm hoping to still be involved with that and hoping that the tournament will still be able to go ahead, uh, depending on what happens here in the next month or two. So I just want to let you know I've been in your seat. That's kind of a little bit clinic talk. I haven't been in your seat because you're probably at home. I've been in a couple of your seats maybe, but uh, I've been in your seat. You know, I started out. Uh, as a young man, after playing, uh, I kind of felt like I wanted to give back, so I got involved in, in Regina minor football. I coached there for a number of years. Uh, I coached in the Regina High School League with a few different teams, and I coached with the Regina Thunder uh, for nine years in two different stints. So, you know, don't just think that I stumbled into this job and I've been, you know, like somebody touched me with the lucky stick. Uh, it took some hard work and some perseverance, you know, and if you're a young coach, uh, just, just sort of stay the course, do your work, and, and people will find out. A couple other things, you know, I wanted to talk about maybe some mentors, uh, some people who've meant a lot to me in coaching over the years. I kind of feel like I've had many mentors, so I didn't want to just put one slide up and sort of single a few people out. Uh, I've sort of, through the coaching fraternity, I've committed myself to some lifelong learning, you know, and some improvement, self-improvement. Uh, not necessarily uh, limited to football, but in this setting primarily related to football. Um, you know, I, I, I am and I have been influenced by uh, people who coached me in the past. You know, it was a long time ago, but those dudes are still kicking. Uh, some of them are real good men. 
uh, you know, I've been mentored and influenced by people that I've, I've coached with in the past or that I've worked for in the past. Uh, some of those men are gone. Uh, others are still, are still kicking around in the community and working. You know, and, and I think I'm mentored and I'm influenced by people that I coach with. You know, and that one might be the biggest one for me. Uh, to me, that's how you get to be better. You know, if you can surround yourself or if you're fortunate enough to be surrounded by people who are great coaches and great men and challenge you, that's how you're going to be a better coach and that's how your team is going to get better. So if you're one of those people in a leadership role on a team where you get to maybe influence or pick some of those people, you know, just, just sort of keep that in mind that, that I think you need to surround yourself with quality people and quality coaches. Okay, I do want to talk a little bit about philosophy and sort of how it relates to team culture. So I say you've probably been, you know, you've been hired uh, by a coordinator or head coach. You probably have a duty to work for that coordinator or head coach, and that guy might be your biggest advocate. So I just, I, I just want you, when you're thinking about your own personal philosophy, to sort of reflect on that a little bit, um, and don't lose sight of that. Uh, a lot of times I've, I've been sort of working through this and, I, and some of the clinics of these e-clinics and virtual clinics that, that have been popping up now because uh, we're a bunch of coaches, we're a bunch of uh, motivated type A people that are trying to do things and suddenly we have nothing to do. So we're, we're all out putting out content or watching content. And one thing I find interesting, uh, a few of these things I'm going to talk about continually pop up when when guys are talking about culture on their team or or culture within their their locker room or even on their coaching staff so you know we all coach an individual group or most of us do um you know and you want your group to strive to have its own identity something you can work towards a common a common theme you know a common thing that you can all talk about you can build with it it's in your meeting rooms you know, some of them are the Hawks or the Cheetah Crew or Ground Crew or Receiver U. You know, and who are you? You're the hardest working. Maybe you're the fastest on the team. You're toughest or, or any of those sort of things. I just wanted to just have you guard against one thing. You know, it's crucial you don't allow your group's identity to go against the core values of the team. For example, if you're always preaching that your group is the toughest, you're the meanest, you're the, you know, just down hard working guys, you know, with the implication that other groups aren't that. So if you say it enough and enough and enough, it might not be direct, but even those little subtle comments can add up. You know, and I heard a guy talk the other day and he said that's where on, on his team it got into now it was offense versus defense. And, and so those things just sort of are something I think that, that I always strive to try and do. Uh, not always 100%, but, but we try and do it and just something to think about you know, in terms of, of uh, my philosophy and, and something you can maybe take a look at in your own group. Another thing is, is your language and actions as an assistant coach, you know, must be aligned with the organizational values as well as the direction from, you know, your coordinator or your head coach. Uh, and again, I think that's something that's important. Um, you see it from time to time on teams. Uh, and sometimes there's a backstory to it, maybe, you know, one coach is trying to get out or something like that and, and he's making it easy maybe for the head coach to try to make a decision for him, you know, in, in professional football, things like that. But I just think once in a while as an assistant coach, we need to kind of take a step back and think about those things. Okay, a little bit more of my philosophy continued. Uh, this is something a lot of guys have heard me talk about. A lot of our coaches talk about it. Uh, you know, it's just be where your feet are. So I, I kind of get a lot of that from Nick Saban. Uh, you can find some pretty good stuff on Saban on YouTube, and, and he's got a couple of really, really good books out. Uh, you know, I'll recommend take a little time out and look for some of that stuff, but, but he's a big proponent of be where your feet are. You know, and if you're going to put that in a nutshell, it's just wherever you happen to be in life, whether you're a football player or a coach or, or a husband or, you know, uh, an employee for somebody, uh, you know, just, just do your job, do the best you can, be engaged, try and be excellent where you're at. That's sort of what he talks about. Uh, so for our players, youth sport players, when we get a youth sport player, he comes out of, out of high school. He's probably been, you know, one of the best five players on his football team. 
Um, he's kind of, you know, he's ready. We've recruited him. You know, he's been recruited by other teams probably in the in the country. And, and all of a sudden he's on our team. And, you know, that kid, first year kid motivated, might be a red shirt, might play. Uh, you, you know, those guys will run through a wall for you. They are probably the epitome of be where your feet are. They're trying to learn everything as much as they can. They're super engaged. Uh, you know, they're, they're exactly what you need. You get about three years of that for sure. Uh, and then we start to enter into a, an odd time in some of these players' uh, you know, lives where the East-West game starts sneaking up on them. Their draft year starts coming. You know, for a handful of our players, every year they fall into this, this category. So as coaches, what we need to do is we need to keep those players focused, be where your feet are. You're still a member of the University of Regina Rams or whatever team you guys may be with facing your own, you know, individual uh, challenges. It's a job as a coach to try and keep them grounded, keep them where they're at and keep them focused. You know, then we run into the problem of the final season and you hear guys starting to talk about, well, this is my last time for insert statement now last time for spring camp last time for main camp last time for first road trip of the year last time for first home game all those sorts of things as coaches what we need to do we need to ground those players make sure they're focused on be where your feet are you know one play at a time doing kind of all those little things right junior football players you guys coaching junior you know you face the exact same thing you face guys, they come out first year, uh, they're out there, they're gung-ho, they're ready to go, they want to do this, that, they're going to change the world. You know, by year three, they might be working a job. I remember when I was coaching the Regina Thunder, we had guys who were doing roofing all day. They'd roll into meetings 10 minutes late, covered in tar and dirt, and, and uh, you know, they're starting to kind of drift away a little bit. They're thinking about money, they're thinking about what they're going to do after they're done. So, you know, just challenging again, different set of challenges. Uh, you guys face the same thing because many of you have university students as well. They're starting to think about graduation or, or maybe moving away to take a different major, things like that. So again, that's a set of, of kind of um, complications that maybe junior guys will have. And, and I know the, probably the majority of guys in the room are, are coaching high school or below. Um, and you guys, I think, are the hardest group right now to deal with this. So you guys have to deal with things like CFC top 100, where, you know, they're, they're ranking the top 100 or 150 guys into like the 2022 year right now. And you got guys in grade 10 or grade nine that are trying to get on those lists. And they're in, you know, they're doing all those things. And don't get me wrong, the CFC is a great, you know, it's a great tool for us. It's super cool for the players. Uh, they get to, to kind of take part in that. It's got a little bit of an American you know, ESPN top whatever feel to it, or Street and Smith's top whatever. Um, but I don't doubt that it, it causes you guys some challenges. You've also got these recruiting services and camps that are always trying to contact your players. They want to take them out. They want to work them out. You know, for a low fee, we're only going to charge you 30 bucks or 50 bucks. Uh, you know, your kid needs to do this. We're going to get some measurables for them. You know, we're going to give that like we're going to give that data to all the U sport teams, all the junior teams. So now these kids are, you know, they're talking about missing something that you might be doing on a weekend uh, to go to one of these camps. And my personal opinion is they don't need to do a bunch of those camps. Uh, if it's a recruiting service or a camp that does testing only and non padded practices, you know, I would say a little bit of buyer beware there. Now there's some of these all-star games that are sort of starting to creep into the picture. Uh, there's some, some all-star games between BC and Alberta. Um, I think called the, the Border Bowls or the ABC Bowls. And uh, those things are taken away from some of those teams there, make it a little more confusing for some of those guys who are coaching those teams and things. And, and I know you guys dealing with guys who are leaving to play on that TSN uh, CFC game. You know, and, and, and you got guys missing maybe camps or whatever. Um, so, again, it's, it's challenging for you right now. You guys also have Football Canada Cup players. You know, and I recognize I've been involved in Football Canada Cup for a long time. And I recognize at times we're probably a pain for you to deal with because I know for a fact uh, 
players may try and sit out of your spring camps or things like that because they don't want to risk injury. Um, and it, it's probably a bit of a pain for you. And, and, and I really appreciate those of you who put your trust in us uh, that we're going to teach your players some good things and allow them to go with it. But, but I do recognize it's a bit of a distraction. You know, and then the last one might be personal trainers. Uh, you know, there's some people who, who want to go and, and they want to get kind of their name made through some football players that are going to be good players down the road. Uh, you know, and, and all of a sudden they start getting in your way a little bit maybe where you're trying to get your players to do one thing and, and you've got somebody paying for a service and, and uh, they might be doing something else. So just a little bit of game buyer beware. They're not all bad. I mean, a lot of those, those personal trainers uh, put out a lot of really good content and, and get a lot of really good results. So I'm just saying it's a distraction and it goes against that be where your feet are. Uh, one thing about the be where your feet are, and I really feel uh, with U18 over about the last five or six years, um, we managed to sort of progress, and I'm using the we in terms of the head coaches that I work for, um, we managed to sort of progress along the way, uh, you know, trying to get an advantage because, you know, population-based, we're, we're one of the smaller provinces uh, continually playing kind of above our weight class. Uh, and competing with the Ontarios and Quebecs and Albertas of the world. And, and um, we just sort of needed to develop a different advantage. And, you know, one of the things we did, be where your feet are, we took recruiting out of the equation for our, for our players. So early on in the process, um, you know, there was representatives from basically all four teams uh, in the province that were kind of either on staff or they were out helping out or they're out, you know, watching and scouting and recruiting. And we just told all the players on the football team at a really, really early process, early uh, stage of the process, that you're going to get recruited. At worst comes to worst, you're going to be recruited by one of the four teams in the province, which might be the best thing that could ever happen to you. You don't need to leave Saskatchewan to go play somewhere else. There's nothing, you know, sometimes the grass isn't always greener somewhere else. So we explained to those young men, you will be recruited. All 40 of you that are on the final team, probably 47 or 50 with, with the Prax roster guys, you know, they're going to recruit you. So when we convinced the players that they were going to be recruited, and when we went down to wherever the tournament happened to be, they are going to be recruited from people down there as well. But when we sort of convinced them that you don't need to focus on all that stuff, that stuff's all going to take care of itself down the road. If a team wants you, the team is going to get you. They don't need to talk to you immediately following our game against whatever opponent. You know, if they really want you, they're going to find you. They're going to get a hold of you on Facebook or some sort of social media, and they're going to recruit you. So when we took that out of the equation, we just had our players engage, be where they're at. Uh, you know, I think that that gave us a bit of a U18 advantage. Uh, there's a few other things we did as well, but in terms of how it relates to this, I think that's fairly important. You know, and this goes for coaches as well. Uh, we don't see it as much here in Saskatchewan. Uh, a little further for guys to move, and, and it just it sort of doesn't happen that much. Um, not as many paid positions either. But you really see it in Ontario and Quebec a lot, where where if you're at one of these international events, uh, guys are are interacting and everything, but they're also sort of working on their next job. And it becomes painfully apparent, and, and you see those guys jump around a lot. So just be where your feet are. You know, if you're always looking to leave, and, and I was a decision maker, I would help the person pack. So uh, this sort of is, is, is kind of an interesting thing. This, uh, you know, only a life lived in the service to others is worth living. So when I started coaching, I didn't really understand this. There's a few things about it. Like I knew I wanted to give back. I enjoyed being involved. I still love the game. You know, I like the strategizing, the game planning, the kind of like, how are we going to beat the other guy? Uh, I like the organizing of practice. I like the organizing of the playbooks. You know, I liked all those things. I love the competitive nature behind it. Uh, you know, it was super good, but I, at times I sort of felt a little bit like, you know, what, why am I coaching? When you lose those heartbreaking games, uh, after you put so much time and effort into it, you know, you sort of sometimes you just go like, you know, well, what am I doing? 
I still love everything about it, but but like what what's the point? And and through conversation with uh, you know some fellow coaches and everything else, th it sort of got me to here. So you know I kind of I never really kind of felt truly fulfilled until I realized it's really it's about servitude, uh, helping others, and, and you know sacrificing and and being non selfish about. It. Okay, enough about the philosophy part. Um, we'll get going with, with kind of the, the skills and drills, meat and potato of the thing. Uh, like Coach Jackson said, if you have any questions, just type them in. Uh, you can do it at any time during the, the session here. You don't have to wait till the end. If you want to wait till the end, you can. I'm going to try and leave time at the end. So we'll just talk a little bit about ball security. Um, I just want to make sure you guys can see this. So. The football, you know, we used to talk about like five points of control and we were going to control the tip of the football. You know, the palm of the hand was going to be on the ball. And it's going to be on our forearm. It's going to be tucked in the back. You know, there's a whole bunch of stuff, right? And um, now kind of the way I teach it is I just say I want the tip of the ball to be higher than the back of the ball. And I want the ball to be tucked up by your chin. You know, tip of the ball higher than the back of the ball. Chin the ball and tuck your elbow into your rib cage. So if you can do all those things, you know, next time you have football, just try that. If you can do all those things, you know, that's probably pretty good ball security. So, you know, we just talk about this. I kind of try and coach with some, um, some code words or whatever, just so I don't have to say, hey, you know, uh, Semba, uh, the tip of the ball wasn't higher than the back of the ball and your elbow wasn't wrenched down against your rib cage. I just tell them somebody had shitty ball posture. So when we talk about ball posture, we talk about this. You know, this is kind of the demeanor we want with football. Uh, and then obviously, if we get into trouble or we're about to be tackled, you know, that second arm can come into play and that can just kind of cover the football. I hope you can see that. So I can just cover the football. Uh, you know, back in the day when we played, everybody carried the ball down here. They, they carried it in their pocket, in the belly, you know, and, and we would kind of two-hand the ball here to protect the ball, you know, and, and Probably it took us about 30 years to figure this out, that this is a far weaker anatomical position than this is. You know, if you want to try, you know, try holding you know, a 100-pound barbell like this for very long or try holding it like this, you know. So the contracted muscles are quite a bit stronger. So, you know, anatomy and physiology wins out of game. So anyway, ball posture, tip of the ball higher than the back of the ball, take care of both tips, elbow, wrenched against your rib cage. Uh, there's a good picture of uh, one of our players when he was a U18. Uh, he's just covering the ball a little bit. I actually think he's changing there. But One thing about ball security, well, two things about this slide, it kind of makes me laugh. Um, yeah, as coaches, kind of what do we do? Well, we steal a lot of things, right? You steal a lot of ideas. You steal a lot of concepts. You know, whatever, you, you might steal some tunnel screen to the boundary that you really like and kind of make it your own. This slide here, all this stuff here is, I stole this like five days ago. So I had a different slide. Uh, this is pretty much word for word from some dude I watched last week. It's pretty good. Uh, you know, the players own their ball security. Uh, it, it can always be improved on. I've never seen anywhere where, where you've got 100% ball security. Uh, it applies to every system. There's a reason I stole it. You know, this applies to every system. So if you're a team, uh, you know, it was interesting to see Coach Mackey speak the other night uh, when he was with Regina Thunder. I was involved in a game. I, I don't know their exact number. I don't remember. Um, he threw the ball like 72 times. I can, something like that against the Hilltops is crazy. Uh, he probably got hit 70 times. Uh, you know, 69 of them were dirty. <laughs> Anyways, it was, uh, it was quite the game to be a part of. But ball security is super important there as well. The quarterback's got ball security responsibility. The receivers have ball security responsibility. Uh, you know, so it can apply to a five receiver, six pack team, whatever, slinging the rock all over the place. You know, ball security applies. It can apply to a, to a, a wing T veer team, things like that, like where, you know, they never throw the football and the ball's either in the quarterback's hands or he's, flipping it or pitching it or handing it off underneath. 
Uh, so it applies to every system. It doesn't matter what system you're in. If you're coaching ball security, uh, you know, that's job security for you. Uh, the other thing is it helps team win. Uh, we've all looked at those stats, you know, and if you watch enough NFL football or CFL football, those stats are jammed down your throat. You know, the team that loses the turnover battle, loses the game. And as coaches and through analytics, you kind of realize that, that that's not maybe totally true, but it, it sure as heck is partially true. So um, we've all been in those games where, you know, you just you, you put the ball on the carpet too many times, you throw too many interceptions, and, and now the game's out of your control. We've won those games, but, but you know, they get a little more challenging. So, anyways, it helps team win. So, those four things, they can always be applied to. And, and you know, the age-old kind of adage, you know, ball security is job security. It's for sure true when it comes to running back spot. You know, the other thing you got to realize is you can coach. So, if you're not actively coaching it, I don't think you're doing a good job. Uh, not my place to judge, but <clears throat> we, we coach ball security almost nonstop. So, as a matter of fact, when I'm bored, uh, if, if we're doing something, maybe we're doing skelly and I haven't yelled at anybody for a little while, you know, and a receiver kind of catches it and does receiver things with it, you know, uh, I'll yell at them. And most of our receivers have been around me enough so they like it and they, they run back. Oh, sorry, Coach Mace. Sorry, sorry. I know, shitty with the ball. <clears throat> so something we do, um, because again, I say it's important. I say it's the most important thing for our young men to deal with is ball security. We talk about it all the time. So I'm going to talk about it. I'm going to be about it. So when we watch film, I hope you can see my cursor here a little bit. This is the front cover of a booklet that our players get every week after we've started playing games. So when I watch film with our, with our players, when I break down the film after our game, I will give a tick. I just do it on a, a booklet. I'll give a tick every time one of our players touches the ball. So these numbers across the top here, uh, adjacent to the 2019 column, are the jersey numbers of all our football players from last year. Total PBS, we call it PBS, uh, just stands for positive ball security. Again, I stole that. I stole that from Paul Lapolis in about 2007 or 8. He did a football SAS clinic in Regina. Uh, I actually found the notes the other day. Um, so we just talk about PBS. We try not to use the word fumble too much in the, in the meeting room. Uh, so we don't talk about fumbles. We talk about being better with, with ball security or, you know, things if we're going to get direct about a better ball posture or, or things like that. So this total PBS here, this, is, this page here is the year-end summary. So this is the number of times each of these corresponding players touch the ball. So, for example, number 25 or 27 touched the ball 95 times. He had two fumbles total for the year, and that gives him a fumble percentage of 2.11. And again, these guys would get this cumulatively uh, throughout the year. Um, you know, so the first game after our preseason game, it looks a little goofy. It's like four, five, four, two, four, four, one, zero, something like that. Uh, the other thing I, I track every play when I watch play, they get one for PBS. You know, if, if they do something stupid with football, it's a little bit hard to read here, but that says B-I-J. It stands for ball in jeopardy. They get a B-I-J, they get a ball in jeopardy. So if they're running with football, you know, and they get the ball away from their body, and they do the classic, you know, swim over top of the player with the football, uh, regardless of whether they fumble or not, they get a ball in jeopardy. You know, and too many of those, and, and we got to start talking about things. Uh, then here, this here is just the cumulative total for the year, uh, the number of carries we had. That includes catches out of the backfield, uh, punts, uh, sorry, punt returns and kick returns, the total number of fumbles we had, and the fumble percentage. And then again, this is just organization down here. This is what we had last year, and this is what we had the years previous, you know, 2018, 2017, 2016. Uh, the 2017 season was was fairly phenomenal. You know, over 350 touches, only two lost footballs, um, and, and a low fumble percentage. Okay, so we'll get into sort of the skills and drills part. Uh, again, just to reiterate, I guess, uh, what we left off was with was the um, kind of the summary sheet that uh, that I use for the running backs for um, – for kind of tracking their ball security and everything else. So 
So we'll get going into the skills and drills. Uh, again, I, I put a bunch of skills and drills in here. Um, I'm a little bit different than Dave in, in Coach Jackson's speech the other night, or clinic talk the other night. He talked about he'll get his guys to do the drill you know, one or two times, and then he'll videotape the third one. Uh, usually I videotape the first one. And, and for no real reason, uh, usually I explain the drill to him, and I videotape the first one, and then a lot of times I'll share the drill uh, through some of our group communication, or we'll, you know, depending where we're at in camp, uh, Ratsy may video it and, and we'll share it the next day in practice. So um, I, I want to talk about drills uh, kind of as they pertain to the team, not necessarily as they pertain to the running back spot to begin with. Uh, you know, I think you need to have a plan. You need to be organized. And, and I really think you need to name your drills and make sure your players name those, uh, know the names and the drills. So uh, I actually got that from Coach Neal, uh, and I'm sure he stole it from somewhere. Um, but if you name your drill, if, if the drill has a name, the Ezekiel Elliott drill is a fairly unique name. Our players know what that drill is. So when I talk to them pre-practice, I say, hey, you know, make sure we have the field equipment to run, you know, bags, we need a shoot and we're gonna run the, the Ezekiel Elliott drill or whatever. So, so they know what it is. And again, I think it just helps you as opposed to saying, you know, hey, we're gonna run that drill with five bags. Four of them are gonna be shaped like this and there's gonna be one bag off the side. And, and it just makes it more efficient. And, you know, and as your players uh, are around you a little bit longer, they'll sort of get to know those things. Uh, I keep a drill inventory. I think again, it's, it's some valuable. And right now in, in kind of uh, coronavirus mode, uh, take an hour out of your day, open a spreadsheet and just write down every drill you do. And, and maybe, you know, I try and break it into categories. Some are agility drills, some are pre-practice drills, uh, some are, are specific to pass protection, uh, things like that. So just write down every drill you do. And maybe you don't give them a name to start with, um, but just write down what it is and, and we'll get to why we do that. Uh, don't get stuck. Um, Everybody's guilty of it. I'm guilty of it too. Uh, sometimes when you know, you're faced with a bunch, there's just a bunch of stuff going on in your life and maybe some weird stuff happening, whatever, with the team. And, and you, sometimes you just go like, man, we're going to go out and we're going to run these three drills because I'm really good at running them. I'm really comfortable with it. Uh, I, I would just encourage you not to do that. And that's where the drill inventory is going to come in. Um, try and keep things fresh you know, change the drill or add a component to increase the difficulty. Our guys get really good at doing drills when they're repetitive. Uh, so if they do a drill a bunch of times, you know, then we'll change the drill somehow. Whatever it might be, we'll make, we'll introduce a shoot so they have to play lower. Uh, we might get them to carry two footballs. Uh, we'll do something different. We might get them to start facing a different direction. Um, might put a ladder in front of the drill so they have to run through the ladder and then go through the drill. Uh, just something to change it up. And when you change the drill, what you should see, uh, especially as you can work younger to older, uh, less skill level to higher skill level, you should find that the players will struggle. So, it, you know, and it gives them something to work towards, um, you know, getting better and, and kind of doing the things you're asking them to do. I'm a firm believer in this one. You know, you need to find out your drill needs uh, from your game tape. So when you watch the game uh, that you just played, you should find out your needs. Maybe, you know, maybe you're just not punching very good on your pass protection, uh, so you got to work a little bit of that. Or maybe your ball security was, you know, not very good. You had a bunch of ball in jeopardies, or you know, maybe a couple of the F word, the fumble, and uh, you know, so so find out your drill needs from your game tape. You know, and share that with your players. It's not a secret. Tell them why you're doing it, and you know, and I think you're going to get more buy-in. Uh, Another real popular question is how long should I do each drill? So I, I would say four minutes is lots, usually. Uh, you know, if you've named the drill, your players know the name of the drill and everything else, you don't have to explain a whole bunch at the beginning. You say, we're going to do this drill, and then they can go out and do it. That gives you four minutes, lots of reps, uh, and it allows you to kind of coach and correct on the go. And that's what I mean by that. Provide feedback. Uh, the players will figure it out pretty quick when they're uh, just going through the drill time after time after time and you're not saying anything, you know, I'd be willing to bet in the back of some of your players' minds 
uh, they're kind of wondering, like, well, like, what are we doing? Coach isn't talking. Uh, he's not providing any feedback for us. So. Individual time. Okay, so everybody coaches at different levels. You know, and I don't know how much individual time you're allotted, uh, depending where you're at. Obviously, some guys, if you're coaching six or nine man, you know, you may have, like, almost no individual time because maybe your player plays quarterback and safety and, and you're – either doing team offense or team defense or something like that. So um, wherever you're at is kind of kind of determine how much indie time you have in a day or in a week. So I want to talk to you about stealing time. Okay. So you're always looking for indie time, you know, try and steal time pre-practice. And, and I get that uh, guys in high school, you know, you may, you may practice at four o'clock. Uh, you may have a job. It may be hard for you to get there pre-practice. If you're able to get there pre-practice, you know, get your running backs. If you're coaching running backs, sorry, I said I wasn't going to make it specific. Get your position group over with you. Tell them you're going to do something for the first 10 minutes. Obviously, doing some sort of burst drill wouldn't be a good idea. They're not warm or, or stretched out. Uh, but you can do something pre-practice. I've got a whole bunch of pre-practice ones we'll go through. Um, but steal time. That also gives you 10 extra minutes to communicate with your players, talk to your players, you know, get to know a little bit more about them maybe, uh, you know, build that relationship, prove to them you care. Um, you know, and, and again, that's just bonus time. That's time that your head coach or your coordinator hasn't stolen. Uh, so just take those 10 minutes and go. There'll be times during the practice potentially when there'll be something going on. And I'll use the example of team defense. So, you know, even if you're in high school and, and uh, they're down there working the defense, chances are all the quarterbacks aren't involved. Uh, maybe all the running backs aren't involved. And so you can maybe just sort of say, hey, let's go down to this other end of the field and work a little bit there. Uh, special teams is another opportunity. Maybe some of your younger players aren't involved on, on all your special teams. Uh, maybe some aren't, depending on your philosophy. But maybe it's a, it's a moment where you can do some drills with them. And again, I would, I would encourage you not to do a drill. Like, don't omit a drill just because you go, well, I've only got three guys. There's six guys in my group. The other three are on teams or maybe on defense or whatever. I would encourage you to find something to do with those three that you have, you know, and kind of tailor that to, to where they're at in their development. <clears throat> and then I would also encourage you to pick one skill and work on it for 10 minutes post-practice. So clear that with your coordinator and your head coach, obviously. Um, but if you just tell your guys, hey, Tuesday after practice, I recognize everybody's going to be tired. Uh, we're just going to stick around for a couple extra minutes, you know, and work on pass pro punch, for example. And, and anyways, if you do all those things, you know, you can buy an extra hour of indie time. So if you explain that to your players, they're going to buy into it. They're going to know you're organized, you know, and you're, you're, you're into trying to make them better, uh, trying to make the team better. And, and I guarantee you they're going to take it serious if you do. So. You know, if anything, you get out of this whole thing, um, you know, other than how to draw funny pictures on the screen, maybe. If there's anything you get out of this, if you can get that, you can steal a full extra hour of, uh, of time for your individual time. So here's what I'm talking about when I talk about a drill inventory. This is just on an Excel spreadsheet. Uh, I just put down all the drills we do. And then during the season, you know, uh, I just print this off and I put it in the front of my playbook. And then during the season, I just make a little tick mark beside each one. And, and pretty soon you find out that, geez, you know, I'm not doing enough of whatever drill. Um, you know, and it just provides a check and balance for you. So again, I would really encourage you to consider this. Uh, if you look at some of those names, they don't mean anything to you. They mean something to me and they mean something to our guys. Some of the things, you know, are exactly what they sound like, you know, ladder drills. Well, ladder drills are, shockingly enough, ladder drills. So. Um, then the other thing I would say is, is again, we talked about it in that other uh, slide, like come with a plan. So plan your indie time out. Uh, so I just put this little capture on the left-hand side here is just, I think this is from our main camp last year. Um, we had 25 minutes of indie. This is right at the beginning of our camp. So I just planned out everything we were going to do. Those are in five-minute blocks. They're actually about a four-minute block by the time you get the next drill ready. Uh, and include a little bit of water in there once in a while. Um, and I just had the whole weekend planned out. So you'll notice there is a little bit of repetition, 
uh, but there's not a lot of repetition. So we're going to do a whole bunch of different things um, and just start out kind of kind of working with a broad range of it. I'll touch on pre-practice. If you have a really good group of kids and they understand, maybe you got a couple of guys in your group that have, have been there a while, and if you can't get their pre-practice, like like trust them to do pre-practice. Communicate with them the day before or that day. You know, send them a text and just say, hey, pre-practice, I need you guys to do these three drills. I can't be there until such and such a time. So, you know, I just show this slide on the right-hand side. Uh, that was four of our players from a couple of years ago. Um, I could have told those guys any drill to do in the world, you know, and, and they would have got it done. They'd have organized it. They'd have taken it seriously. You know, uh, little Anaka, he'd have got everybody fired up and got them running and going. And, and uh, so if you know your guys and you trust them, uh, you know, let them do it. Put it on them. Okay, we'll kind of fire through this. Uh, I realize it's been a long night, um, a little ex extra added time here. So pre-practice stuff. I don't know how this is going to come through on your screen. I hope it's not too choppy. Uh, it's just the same drill over and over. We just call this mesh. Um, basically, we're going to run all our base plays. We're going to have four quarterbacks set up across the field. You know, numbers, hash, hash, numbers. You may not have four quarterbacks. You may have two. You know, you could put one quarterback on each hash. Uh, you're going to call out the play, and you're going to run it. Now, this is a this is from our high school camp last summer. Um, there was a team from Cabo San Lucas in town to play the selects. Uh, so we had a bunch of their players on our camp, so it was awesome. Um, trying to communicate with some of these guys. Some of these guys didn't speak English very well uh, or at all. Um, so we were trying to do this, and, and it was great. Uh, so this, we're just running outside zone here. I'll say the kid here in the green, the green uh, shorts, his track is too tight there. Um, so you would want to correct them on that. So you can correct, you know, everything track. You can watch the, the running back's eyes. You know, so if you go on the other side of the drill out here, uh, you can see where the running back's looking. Is he peeking for the ball? You know, you stand behind him, you can check his footwork. Uh, they use a scissor kick, um, like the scissor step for their outside zone. So it was good to talk to him about that a little bit. Uh, we used to do that a lot. I actually still like it. It's got a, a time and a place for it. You know, and the, and the only other thing I would say is use a center. If you can get your center away from your O-line guys for a couple minutes, uh, pre-practice, they can work on their snapping. Uh, and then, you know, the quarterback coach is probably over here with you. So he should be telling that guy, you know, boot, up, boot away a little harder, uh, whatever we happen to be doing at the time. You know, and then only use one cadence. Uh, I recognize cadence is spelt wrong there. I'm sorry. Uh, use one cadence and then tell everybody else it's kind of like, you know, choir practice. So when the one guy is saying it, the other guys are saying it in their mind. Uh, and you get kind of just, you're trying to get that consistency of cadence uh, in terms of tempo, you know, and volume and things like that. So we call that mesh. We do it every day and we, we go through our base run plays. Uh, you know, and this might be the best five or 10 minutes of practice. Okay, we also do some pre-practice ball handling. All this is meant to do is just get the guys used to having the football in their hand, get them used to feeling it. Uh, you know, we start out, just go around the waist, go one direction, then as coach, you just say switch, and they switch direction. Um, you know, and this whole little progression here takes about three minutes. You know, then we go below the knees and just work around, work around, say switch, switch direction, they go the other way. And then we go around the head. This one, I actually, I kind of question myself sometimes why we do it. Um, but again, it's just about getting guys used to handling the ball. You know, if guys are going to play with gloves, uh, play with gloves, things like that. So again, then we'll put one leg forward. If you guys have ever played basketball, just basically rip off all your basketball dribble drills, uh, do that. And uh, then we'll put the other leg forward. We'll go put the, the other leg back forward again. We're going to go figure eights, you know, and then halfway through, we'll just switch direction. They switch direction again. You know, we'll go with some ball drops. Again, just getting guys kind of bending at the hips, bending at the knees, getting them a little bit loose. You know, and again, this right now we've taken two minutes, you know, and, and guys have had the football in their hands an awful lot. You know, and then the guys will buy into it and they'll do all that other kind of stuff as long as you let them do a few ball tricks at the end. Uh, so we talked to them about, you know, we just want them to work on getting strong fingers, strong hands, uh, feeling the football. 
uh, you know, there's a bunch of these, these tricks. Aaron Rodgers does some on YouTube. You can drop the ball. You can try and circle your hand around it and then re-catch the ball. Uh, we're just working some ball rolls here. You know, then make sure they're working both hands. We want them kind of working both hands on that. So uh, the, the ball handling stuff we do all the time, that would be a great drill that if you can't be there, you tell your players, hey, pre-practice, I need you to get in five minutes of ball handling. So a uh, tip ball drill, I really like this drill. The running back position is actually, oddly enough, a position uh, that will catch tip balls. You know, they're a little bit like the secondary, guys, you know, linebackers, D linemen, D backs. Uh, that will will intercept D balls from time to time, tip balls, sorry, time to time. You know, running backs will catch tip balls from time to time on a check down route or a screen. So all we do is we just get them in a line. Uh, you know, the guy on the left here, the, the two dudes who are a little bit injured this day, they're over here and they're just providing a tip ball. So we just flip it to them. Uh, we tell the guys catching it, uh, we want them to tuck it away every time. We want them to alternate hands. So no matter where the ball goes, they're going to go left hand, right hand, left hand, right hand. Okay, and then uh, if the guys are good, usually I'll, I'll usually do one of these lines and just make the guys work. I'll put the ball up high, down low, put it away from their arm when they have to go into the other hand, and, and just really, you know, preach, get preachy at them about, uh, like, tucking the ball away and looking at it all the way. And I think our guys do a decent job here. You can see Trey here, number five. You know, he's – He's uh, doing a nice job of tucking the ball right in, looking it in. You know, and for the guys flipping it to him, just tell them to mix it up. No good balls. Like, always try and give them a bad ball, something fluttering, you know, falling away, climbing, whatever. Okay, a few agility drills that we do. Uh, we do this probably three times a week. Um, you know, we just have a name for it. We used to just call it bag work, whatever. Now, for this part, we call it strides. Uh, a few coaching points, you know, we want ball security all the time. You see our guys are doing a good, pretty good job here with good ball posture, tip of the ball higher than the back of the ball. You know, the, the other keys we want to look at, we want to look at pad level. I think our guys are all too high here. Uh, this is a couple of years ago, early morning workout. This is probably like 6, 10 in the morning. Uh, so they should be a little lower, but they're probably still waking up. Uh, we want to be smooth through the bags. We don't want their heads popping up and down, up and down, up and down. You can tell a real good runner is a, a smooth runner. We don't let them change the ball. And this drill can be done at warm-up tempo as well. So this potentially could be a, a pre-practice drill, get their knees, ankles, and hips a little bit loose. Uh, we always do the same progression. So if we're working towards uh, where the camera is, like this drill, this part of the field over here, you know, to the left of the screen, that would sort of represent the sideline. So we get them to put the ball in the sideline arm to protect, uh, you know, ball away from the majority of defenders. Uh, so when we come this way, the ball would be in the right hand. And when we go back, the ball would be in the left hand. I just don't have a video of that right now. There's one coming up. We just call this strides. Strides just means one foot in each hole. Quick feet, everything else is the same, except quick feet's two feet in a hole. All the coaching points are the same. Again, you'll notice as they're working this direction, the ball is in the right hand, because again, this would represent the boundary, you know, or the out of bounds, whatever you want to call it. Um, ball in the right hand, going through quick feet. Again, just get them loose, get them warm, get them used to picking their feet up. There's going to be some bodies on the ground when they're running the ball. Want to get them used to picking their feet up a little bit. Okay, combo is where they're going to do one of each. Okay, and we've messed around with combo a little bit. We do some different things with football now. Um, I think at this time we were just going, leading with left football on the left hand. So on the way down, they're doing strides. Then they turn around as quick as they can. They're going to do quick feet on the way back. So no ball change. We actually ball change now. Uh, we would say this is the boundary. So they would come down this way with the ball in their right hand. Then they would make this change and they would go back that direction with the ball in their left hand. Okay, and just another variation of it, um, you know, but now we've included the shoot. So if you can see it here, there's a shoot here where the players have to run underneath it. Uh, everything, you know, we put the shoot in when we're doing a bad job of pad level. Uh, so we want them to lower their pads, lower their helmet. Um, so again, same thing, strides with a shoot. So they're doing the same thing, you know, ball in the left hand, that's where the boundary is, sidelines right there, leading with their left foot. And you see they do a nice job of nice low pad level, nice and smooth. Uh, this is the U18 running back group from last year. 
Uh, we're missing one guy out of this picture, but uh, these kids did, did a real nice job for us and, and learned really quick about some of the different drills we do. Here would be quick feet with the shoot. Again, a little bit different. Uh, when you do quick feet, they tend to want to kind of raise up a little bit. Um, so these guys do a nice job of getting through here. You'll see the second guy here, Brandon Horvath uh, from Balgoni. He hasn't done this a whole bunch. He's from Greenall. You see, see he's going to cover the ball with two hands. And, uh, we've asked him not to do that. But again, he's introduced to a drill. He's being, he's being physically challenged. And so his, his kind of coping mechanism, I'm going to cover the ball with both hands. So he does a good job of it. But again, that was a new skill that was introduced to him. And that's the reaction you get. Again, we've still got the shoot here. We can introduce some double jump cuts, things like this. And I'm not going to get real particular about the details of the jump cut drill. Uh, get them to jump cut how you want them to. You know, we want them to press the heels of the old lineman and, and, get ver and get horizontal like one gap over before they get vertical again immediately. Coaching point I talked about is closed chest. So in other words, we don't want them rising up as they do the jump cut, uh, you know, and giving the, the tackler the chest. Uh, this is a U18 group from a couple of years ago. They do a pretty good job here. You can tell the guys who maybe aren't natural jumpers, uh, the fullback types there. Um, but again, it's a good footwork drill. It works on pad level. Uh, it works as an explosive drill for run and zone run. It allows you to get from one gap to another. Okay, so for the shoot itself, uh, like Gilman makes these things. They're a couple hundred bucks each. Um, Gilman also realizes, I think, that there's a lot of youth coaches out there that can't afford to buy a couple of shoots for a couple hundred bucks. So here's the gist of how to make the shoot. Buy three six-foot sections of inch and a half ABS pipe. Cut two of them at 54 inches. The remaining 18 inches become the legs. You know, cut a, uh, the, the other one at 36 inches, and then two at 18 inches from that 36. That becomes two of the other legs. Buy two elbows, uh, two T's cost you about 37 bucks. So when you look here, uh, sorry, I want to go the other way. So when you look here at the chute, you know, these are the two 54 inch pieces. This is a 36 inch piece. And these are all the 18 inch leftover pieces for the legs at the bottom. I hope everybody is able to see that. Um, if not, again, that's one of those things you can email me and I'll send you that exact thing. Uh, you know, if you can't afford bags, you can do the same thing to make those little mini track hurdles. Uh, just do the same thing, except make it way smaller to scale. Here's that drill I was talking about, Ezekiel Elliott's just a forward drill. Uh, you know, it makes you go over the bag uh, a couple of different ways. You've got to go two steps, two steps. Then you've got to go three to get your feet back correct. And again, we've got to finish there uh, through the chute. Low pad level, you'll know good ball, good ball posture by most of the guys. You know, ball's in the wrong hand there by Benny. He's just coming back off an ACL surgery at that point. You'll see he was a little hesitant running. Uh, everybody also pretty good ball posture. Uh, real good job with the feet. And you, you know, ball in the right hand, sidelines over here. Once your guys kind of get it, you don't have to tell them every time. So anyway, it's an interesting little drill. Obviously, you know, Ezekiel Elliott probably did it. Uh, that's where I saw it. So we just called the Ezekiel Elliott drill. Uh, no ball change. We don't need ball change in this. It's just about working your feet. Again, uh, you'll see the guys who have really good feet. This is actually, we had done this drill before, but this is probably the first time we ran it. And uh, our guys do a pretty remarkable job with their feet. Uh, the first time you run it with your athletes, it's probably not going to look like that. Okay, some pass protection things. Uh, I just want to talk about this drill a little bit. We're just right here, we're only working punch and first step. So we're talking about, uh, you know, the punch is probably the most important part, the initial punch um, for pass protection. And, and we always talk about, we wanna be the low man, we wanna be first. Um, so we introduce the shoot. So the shoot forces him to get low, and then you can see the rotation, one guy takes the punch, and then he stays back and he becomes the linebacker the next play. Um, a few things to, to worry about. And again, I don't want to get into all the coaching points of this. Uh, you guys probably know it better than I do. Uh, you know, you want their eyes. You want them to focus, you know, not at the other player's eyes or head. You want them to focus in on that core part of the chest. That part doesn't move. Uh, you know, they got to get in a good position to start. We want them to have neutral hands. Okay, Blake does a nice job there with neutral hands. 
Uh, we don't want them to have low hands and then gunsling a whole bunch. Uh, when they gunsling, in other words, when they draw their hands back to engage and build some momentum up for the punch, uh, the good linebackers, they start realizing that when that guy's starting to, to gunsling, uh, they're going to activate their hands and probably get their hands, you know, they're going to win the chest plate. You see that rep there? A little bit of a gunsling. And then the other thing is we always talk feet before hands, so we want to emphasize the step before the punch. So again, we'll watch Blake. He does a good job here. Neutral hands, okay, feet before the punch. Good job. We only want the first step here. It's nothing else. This drill looks stupid at times, but okay, that was hands before feet. Okay, now in a, in a real situation, if he shoots his hands out, he may get off balance. You know, it tends to get a little leany, top heavy. See there, Semba, young player for us at that time, he was really focusing on hands before feet, and you'll see him just sort of make a little twitch. And there again was that bit of a gun sling there. So, and, and we do this on the whistle because again, it's only, it's only one step. And then the progression of this drill as you work through it would be now they're going to engage and drive. Uh, if you don't want a player doing it, you can do it with a bag, just with a hand shield. Again, I would recommend the shoot. Now they're going to go hands before feet. Then they're going to get good foot fire, and they're going to drive back as you provide resistance. And then the next progression behind that would be they're going to get good foot fire. They're going to drive. You're going to provide resistance. And then you're going to go one direction or another, and they're going to keep resistance with you uh, without crossing their feet or anything like that. Okay, and again, another version, just punch. We're just working punch here. And then once we get done the punch, now we're gonna kind of get back to that, that position where we've got an edge rusher maybe coming late. And we're gonna try and essentially, you know, fly him by the quarterback. To use the special teams lingo, you know, that's almost like that flyby. Kind of what I feel right now. Now we, we play some monster linebackers in our league. Uh, so if we can get in this position right there, we're in good shape. We can win with our feet. You know, we might be in a little more trouble when we get squared up with them in the hole. Uh, we're allowed to cup lock a little bit, so that, that equalizes a few things. But, but when we can get in that position right here, we can win that with our feet because our feet are better than most of the linebackers. Uh, they're a little more stout than us. So, so and again, you know, we're going to work the punch part of this to start with. You'll see here Trey does a nice job. Neutral hands. You know, he, his hands are nice and neutral and low. We want to strike with the heels of our hands. We would like a little slight you know, downward to upward trajectory on it. And we really want to concentrate on telling them, you know, elbows in, thumbs up. So the young guys always feel strong when they're like this. They feel like a bench press position will be stronger. Uh, but you know, it's not, you can't strike as quick as you can uh, like this as well. So, and you're not necessarily doing like double unders up, but we do want to have neutral hands and we want to force that strike up into the chest plate. Uh, and then, you know, we'll use some, some grip tools in there. Uh, to try and control the direction of the rusher a little bit as well. Okay, I call this Temple of Boom. Uh, this is stolen from some old line guys. Uh, you know, I think Coach Neal would correct me, this might be called Temple of Doom. But because I call it Temple of Boom, I'm going to keep calling it Temple of Boom. So all you're going to work on is just a punch. You're working on the, the running back, you know, moving his feet, uh, going laterally. Um, again, this is the first time we've done this drill. So the guys holding the bags aren't doing a great job either, but as a coach, you stand in behind the running back, you tell which player to activate. He then slides the shield up in the air and the blocking running back works towards it. And as he works towards it, then they're gonna fire the bag down and he needs to try and punch the bag before it touches him in the helmet. Uh, a lot of variations of it, but you can just tell the back to keep one of his post feet forward so he's not changing the, the post foot here. You know, Christian would be working this left foot as a post foot. Um, you know, we don't want to step too far and get too over overstrided. Uh, he's doing a decent job here for the most part for kind of the first time he's run the drill. So uh, I think it's fairly self-explanatory. Easy drill to do, uh, really works on moving their feet, moving laterally and, and tr trying to keep that front post foot forward. The other thing you can incorporate as well is, is after a certain amount of time, you can tell the middle guy uh, to bull rush and then the running back can use, you know, a hop, hop, retreat, uh, trying to save some ground and, and anchoring his butt. And I think Coach Durazio did a good job of talking about that the other day. Okay, a couple game-like drills. Um, we just do this as a reaction drill. So 
what I would tell you to do is, is the coaching points are all going to be the same ball security pad level, you know, where your eyes focused, uh, use your plays when you're doing this. So for example, for us, this might be like 30 Zorro out of the offset. Um, so use your plays and call them out, tell the players what we're doing, uh, tell them what position you're in. So here I'm kind of like a nose tackle and, and we want them to react off of me. I'm not, this isn't very flattering, but I'm not doing a great job here. You know, now what I do is I just use a bag and I just tilt the bag one direction or the other. And that kind of shows, uh, you know, where the D lineman's helmet would go. And then re we react off of, after that. Uh, in this drill, we use full cadence. We use full cadence and we want the back to take his proper footwork, to press the heels of the old lineman, to make the decision as close to the uh, offensive line, as close to the double team as possible. And then they just get vertical through the hole. You know, we're a little bit sloppy with football here a couple times. Uh, again, it was a new drill we were trying out. Um, I think it's super effective. And again, you can do the same drill for your outside zone game. So, you know, you would just maybe, if, you're, if your first read is out here, you know, you'd stand out here with a bag and you'd do the same thing. But I would encourage you to, you know, whatever you're doing it at, make sure the back is in the right place in relation uh, to the line of scrimmage. We just use the bags to be like the offensive lineman. Um, you know, if he's seven yards deep in the pistol, put a cone back there. So he's seven yards in the pistol. Uh, you can work his track, uh, work his eye focus. You know, he's got to read you. And maybe he's got a, another read back inside, something like that. So again, all these, I would do this drill, you know, we don't do it enough with our guys, but I would do it a little bit more, um, maybe once a week and, and pick plays that are kind of your base or your core plays. So that's just an inside zone reaction drill. Again, it can be outside zone, uh, it can be trap, can be whatever you run. You know, it can be counter, great play that counter. So, you know, the guy just puts his counter footwork in and you tell him who to read and, and you become one of the linebackers maybe flowing with the counter, so. Okay, inside zone and breaking tackles. You know, and again, I recognize that not everybody has the luxury of, of having two pop-ups, uh, a bunch of bags and all that stuff. You don't need it. You know, you can get a couple of players with hand shields or a coach and a, 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 coach and a backup quarterback or whatever with a hand shield. Good luck trying to get that out. But anyways, you can use a couple of players and do the same thing. So this, again, would be like 30 Zorro for us. So just watch their footwork. They're all pretty good with their footwork. Uh, that was a pretty good job. Blake had ran that. This is good. Good job with the footwork. I'll get to the other stuff in a second. Here we get a weird skip hop. This is the kid's kind of first time with us. Uh, we don't do that necessarily. Um, but again, what it allows you to do is work your footwork uh, and then, you know, break a tackle going through those two and then get back into the bags. See Big Atlee's head was down a little bit there. Again, he as he was running by me, he was mad because he knew he was on camera. Uh, little Blaker does a good job. You know, and again, it's just something, if you do that other reaction drill a whole bunch, then just add this. It's something new for them. You know, and as a coach, you could stand at this end down here, kind of like that combine drill, you know, and just give the player a, a, a go. So if you, you know, step inside, he's got to cut outside and get back vertical as much as he can. You know, and again, I would call this play. I would say, we're going to run 30 Zorro. It's going to be on one. And I would go through the full cadence. So. Okay, we do do some receiving drills. I got to fire through this. You guys are going to be here all night. Uh, we do a little bit of tennis ball work. You know, tennis balls force them to catch with their fingers, not the palms of their hands. Um, you know, and you'll notice the guys in the background are doing some pair passing uh, with a purpose. Hopefully, you know, we want them to tuck it away and, and you give them a, a kind of a routine to do down there. Uh, these things improve hand-eye hand -eye coordination. You know, uh, it can be a pre-practice drill quite easily. You can combine it with other catching skills. Um, you know, do it with your helmet on, though. Okay, rapid fire. Uh, again, first time we've done it. You know, Semba forgets to put the ball down a couple times here. But again, it's just working hand-eye coordination. One hand catches. Uh, if you never practice it, you're never going to get it. So again, uh, confidence builder. Uh, the guy throwing the ball is as important as the guy catching the ball. Okay, and then again, we can work laterally here. Guy throwing the ball is going to make him work just side to side, side to side. Again, catching with your fingers, not the palm of your hands. If you had to try and catch with the palm, ball is going to bounce in. 
or bounce away from you. Uh, nice job here, that was a pretty good rep. We call this one catch six, this is just a fun one. I would, you know, in hindsight, I would tell him to put his helmet on. Uh, but you can see um, Julio Jones has some good stuff on YouTube where he catches six. Um, so the, the idea is your athlete's got to catch the first one and he's got to keep working the balls down towards the bottom of his hand to try and give him room to catch, you know, the, the remaining tennis balls as they come at him. The players love this one. Uh, you can get a lot of buy-in for the other drills if you give them a little you know, chance to catch six at the end. Uh, we put the video camera on them a lot, uh, like just the phone, but they get fired up when they're doing it because uh, they all want to get catch six perfect on camera. Uh, you know, throw your tree. So whatever you ask your running backs to do out of the backfield, uh, do it in, in practice. So just get a quarterback. You know, if you got a real good arm, do it. But um, get a quarterback and just run all the routes you run. So if you run a swing, a flat, a wheel, you know, some sort of a vertical component and a check down, just fire through those. You can get through that, your whole tree in like five minutes. Super valuable. A couple other things. You know, guys always ask uh, if you're on the one yard line or if you're, you're on your way to score, you know, do you let your running back reach out with the football, you know, to try and break the plane of the end zone to try and score or to reach out for a first down? You know, those sort of things. It's a common thing whenever you see it in professional football and the guy reaches out and he fumbles it, you know, the commentators are all over him. Um, so my answer to that is, is sometimes, sort of. So the quick answer is no. So if a player asks me right away, Coach, can I reach out for that? Like I say, no, um, you can't. I want you to keep the ball protected. You know, all that stuff that we talked about, ball security, all the, the film review, you know, we don't want the ball to be kind of, willy-nilly away from our body with very little control over it. You'll see Mitch here on the left, you know, reaching out. He's trying to get that extra yardage by putting his palm down, you know, and propelling his body forward. So the quick answer is no. Uh, serious consideration is down on distance. If it's third down, then absolutely reach out and get what you can get. Because if you don't get the first down, it doesn't matter. Uh, balls go in the other direction anyways. And the other thing I would say is trust your player. Okay, play, playmakers make plays. Uh, this picture on the right here with Jens, you know, he'd been around a long time. He's a very mature player. Uh, you know, I knew if he was going to try and do that, that, you know, he was doing it in a, as safe a situation as he could, you know, reaching out towards the end zone, try and break the play. Uh, you know, and, and you got to trust your players, man. Playmakers are going to make plays. You got to let them do things. They're not robots. Uh, you know, but but if they're really young and they're only going to touch the ball a couple of times, you know, like the answer would be no. And then sort of a, to kind of to sort of summarize here a few things, you know, if you can't afford all that kind of field equipment that some schools have, you know, the, the schools are, are lucky enough to have a bunch of that stuff. You can get by with other things. Oops, sorry. You can get by with other things. You know, you'll see here like these little sticks. You can just get these little plastic sticks and the guys can, they can run through those. Um, they can act, act like bags. These cones over here, you know, those can act like bags and the players, we're just doing, you know, like our bag work, our strides, our combo here. Um, just like, you know, just like anything. We don't have bags there at that time. So we just work something else. So um, you don't need all the fancy stuff. Uh, you can get by with other things. You know, if I was a young coach just starting out, uh, you, you know, almost no matter what program you're at, you know, I would go out and I'd buy four step over bags myself. I recognize they're a little bit of money, um, but if you're going to coach for a long time, I would invest in it. The next thing I would buy is, is a set of cones. You know, those things are like five bucks at the dollar store or something. Uh, you can probably find them, track clubs, have lots of them around, and things like that. I'd probably buy a bag of like three or four rubber football. Uh, everybody's always in a football crunch. You know, I coached, like I said, high school and minor football for a long time. If you had four or five of size appropriate footballs for your athlete that are rubber, you will never have to worry about not working with football. I get it, the texture is a little bit different, but at least you can work all, all sorts of, uh, you know, ball security drills and everything else and you'll have a football in your hands. And then I'd make a shoot. You know, just go buy all that stuff. You don't have to even be handy. We don't glue our shoots together. They all come apart in different pieces. Uh, that way you can throw it in a bag. You can bring it wherever you want to bring it. 
Um, all, everybody, you're always welcome to come to our practices. I know we're in a bit of an uncertain time right now. Nobody knows when anybody's going to get, get going or anything like that. You know, you're always welcome to drop by. Uh, this is my contact info. Uh, hopefully you can write that down uh, or again, check it out on YouTube later. Um, you know, I'm willing to help. I'm willing to answer any question you have. I'll share stuff with you. I got a pile of video. Uh, if you can give me a, a flash drive or something, I'm willing to share all that. Uh, and you know, with the with the Rams, we have a pretty open policy. We want people coming to our program. We want guys checking it out, and, and we're willing to help however we can. So, uh, with that, I want to thank everyone. Uh, obviously, a little bit of a distraction there in the minute, uh, in the middle there for a minute. And uh, I'll give credit for everybody who who kind of came back and took some time. Uh, and if there's any questions, uh, Dave, you can let me know. Yeah, we do have one question here. Um, I, I think you answered it for the most part, but it, it's just asking uh, if you can recommend three or four pieces of equipment uh, for coaching running backs that aren't step over bags. So sure. top three or four that aren't step over bags. Sure. Okay. So uh, again, I would build a shoot first. Like that's going to cost you 40 bucks or something. I'd build the shoot. Uh, I would try and get a couple of, of like handheld bags. Um, that you can work for, for guys punching it or guys hitting it. You know, as a coach, you can kind of use it to protect yourself a little bit. Uh, those can also be put on the ground and used as bags. Uh, so I'd, I'd get those two things. I would stay away from things like those giant square bags, you know, that we all got. Your, uh, some of you young guys won't, won't get this reference, but our head coaches in high school all went and bought us those big square shields, you know, and then they'd give you two of them. And, and somehow you're supposed to be forever in their gratitude. Uh, you know, your high school athlete can barely step over the damn thing. Uh, they're almost no good. And uh, so, I, you know, I would, get, I would get smaller bags. I'd stay away from those big bags. Um, and then, like, get some of that weird track stuff. Those track guys got lots of cool stuff. Uh, you can get those mini hurdles. You know, those things, you can buy all that stuff on Amazon. Um, I actually have a bag in my truck with a bunch of those, just those yellow uh, pieces of pipe and some mini hurdles. That way, if we go practice anywhere else, you know, I've got some stuff with me and, and go from there. And some rubber footballs as well. Thanks again, Coach Mason. Always enjoy uh, listening to you and learning from you. Uh, so I appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Great. Thanks, everybody. Good luck this season.